Today we're going to be talking about uh, a theme that I think is um, uh, just crucial to understand that is often uh, misunderstood, and it's the subject of spiritual warfare taught throughout the scriptures. A uh, boy was asking his father, a mom was in the kitchen, they were cleaning up after supper, and he said, Dad, how do wars start? And the father said, well, World War I, for example, started when Germany invaded Belgium. And the wife hearing that said, you're trying to soften it for the boy. Tell him the truth. Someone was murdered. And he stood up and said, well, who's answering this question? You or me? And she went out of the kitchen with a huff and slammed the door. And then the uh, dishes stopped rattling in the cupboard. There was a long silence. And the boy said to his dad, Dad, you need, don't need to tell me now. I understand how wars start. <laughs> and it's really it, as simple as that. It's uh, usually selfishness that starts wars, and that was the beginning of the first war. Um, unfortunately, Jesus said there will be wars and rumors of wars, but the end is not yet, and we've seen plenty of war in human history. Someone said just in the last six, 3,600 years, uh, the world has known only 292 years of peace out of 3,600. During this period, there have been 1,400, 1, I'm sorry, 14,531 wars, large and small, in which 3,640,000,000 no, people have been killed in these wars through history. The value of destruction would pay for a golden belt around the world, 97 miles in width, and 33 feet thick. That's how much has been spent on war. Biggest part of the American budget is the military. Matter of fact, America has the largest military budget of any country in the world. Well, we are at war. There is a war that is going on right now. Uh, we don't like to think about it. If you're a Christian, you think, well, I don't want to be involved in war, then you're, um, then you're, yeah, you're, you're, you're missing out on what's really going on around you. And that's just the way the devil would like to have it. Uh, a lot of churches and pastors are telling people you come to Jesus and everything is smooth sailing. In reality, you become an adversary of the enemy when you decide to be a Christian and you will encounter all kinds of resistance. If you do not sense the war that is going on between the forces of good and evil, even in your own life, if you don't see it in the country, then it might be because you're in the river going towards destruction and you're not swimming against the current. As soon as you begin to swim against the current, you're going to know something about that war. Pastor Billy Sunday used to uh, preach frequently about sin and repentance. And, and one day someone came to him and said, Pastor Sunday, will you please stop rubbing the cat's fur the wrong way? He says, you're always rubbing the cat's fur the wrong way. And Billy Sunday said, that's because the cat needs to turn around. Then I'll be rubbing the fur the right way. And uh, in the world, Jesus said, if the world hated me, it's going to hate you. There is a conflict going on. There is a clash of kingdoms that is taking place in the world today. Now, many nations have been overcome because they were lulled to sleep by the enemy, being told there was no threat of war. The devil doesn't want us to be aware that there's a war going on. You know, one of the most embarrassing moments for the United States was 9-11, was uh, Pearl Harbor, <laughs> not much 9-11 when uh, our military was attacked. And you know, when the military was attacked, the Japanese had peace ambassadors in Washington talking about a peace treaty. And so everybody thought, oh, they won't attack now. And they did it on a Sunday morning uh, after everyone had had a night out on the town. And they basically caught the American Navy unprepared. And uh, of course, we got even at the end, but uh, it was very embarrassing. They took advantage of that truth that you lull your enemy into thinking that there really is no war, that we're all friends. Can't we all just get along? The devil wants us to say, oh yeah, let's just do our best to get along. We don't want to be at war. Well, you just need to make up your mind who you want to be at war with. Uh, you are either in the devil's hands, and Jesus said, if you're not with me, you're what? You're against me. And you're on the losing team, if you didn't know that. Or you decide to follow Jesus, and that's going to aggravate the devil. 
but Jesus wins in the end. And so, but you can't escape that we are in this world and there is a battle, there is a war going on. You know, the uh, Hitler was able to trick the Russians into signing a peace treaty just before World War II, so they would not resist his invasion of Poland, and then later he attacked them in spite of the peace treaty, and they were not prepared for that first initial attack. Nazis marched almost all the way to Moscow because he had lulled them into thinking, you don't need to make war preparations, I'm going to give you a, a treaty, uh, we're going to have a pact, everything's going to be okay. Uh, and that's the way the devil works. He doesn't want us to be aware there's a war, because if you think there's a war, you will prepare. Who was it? Norman Schwarzkopf that said, the more you sweat in peace, the less you bleed in war. What he means by that is, in the times of peace, you need to be preparing and sweating so that when the war does come, you don't bleed. And that's a good policy of preparing. You know, a few years ago, I was on an airplane and I um, was offered this free um, book. It was some audible book program and, and one of the free books they offer you, everything else you pay for, was um, it was a book called The Art of War by Sun Tzu. And it was, it's an ancient book, goes back like three, 2,000 years before Christ. A Chinese warrior, writer, general, uh, wrote this book on the art of war and it's full of all kinds of very interesting dynamics. And the book has recently become a bestseller again because people realize the principles about the art of war also apply not only to war, but they apply to business. And in many ways they apply to the Christian life. There are certain basic principles. For one thing, he said, if you're ignorant both of your enemy and yourself, you are certain to be in peril. So, before two boxers go into the ring, if it's any kind of an important fight, their managers will sit down and they will look at film or video or DVD of the matches of the opponent. And they will look at it and they will study it frame by frame and they'll say, ah, Notice what this guy does, is when you do a fake, he does a duck, and that'll leave him open to an uppercut, and they evaluate all of the habits of the opponent, so they can train their fighter, when you go in, this is what his habit is, this is what his tactics are, and these need to be your tactics to win. Now, I don't like it when people are preoccupied with talking about the devil. Uh, I don't want to do it any more than God does it, but Jesus does it. And Jesus talks about the devil so that we will know something about the tactics of the enemy and we will not be taken off guard and we will be prepared. Something else you need to be aware of. You know, the devil is out there. We've got guardian angels, but the devil's got fallen angels. Just like God has guardian angels, the devil's probably appointed angels to study especially the weaknesses of Christians and uh, they're going to study your tactics. They're going to study your weaknesses. And they're going to exploit that to do what they can to get you to sin or become discouraged or give up in your faith. And so being aware that there is someone who's out to get you helps you prepare. So there is a battle going on and it's also taking place in heavenly places. It's a tragic misconception Christians have of what it means to take up the cross and follow Jesus. We are part of two clashing kingdoms. Christians are not invited to a picnic. We are recruited to the front lines of a severe conflict. The words the Bible uses to describe the Christian life are war, wrestling, fighting, striving, battling, running. We are called, according to Paul, to be soldiers. And yet you seldom hear about that. People are saying, just come to Jesus, everything's okay. It's a struggle. There's a struggle. It's wrestling. You ever wrestle? Ephesians 6, we just heard, we wrestle not. Uh, when I was in military school, I was on a wrestling team. And um, wrestling, uh, my, I used to box too, but wrestling is different. Uh, you know, in, in boxing, you're supposed to just hit above the waist and you get the certain rules, but wrestling, you just get in there and you grapple and you pit all of your strength against your opponent and you're pushing with all of your might and they are pushing with all of your might and you're in close contact, sometimes much closer than you want to be, in trying to uh, overthrow and pin that person. In Bible times, they didn't shoot guns. 
They might throw a spear or fire an arrow, but then they eventually engage the enemy, and it often turned into hand-to-hand combat. A few times in World War I and World War II, they had encounters where it turned into hand-to-hand combat. Now everything is, you know, aircraft and drones and mechanized war, but back then it was wrestling with the enemy, like Jacob wrestled with a heavenly force. We sometimes have to wrestle, and uh, we need to be aware that that's the reality. Now, I meet people all the time, and when they read the Bible, they say, Pastor Doug, why is the Old Testament so full of wars and battles? And there's also some in the New Testament, but I said, that's because all of those, they're real history, but they're also allegories. Every one of those battles tells us something about how someone was overcome and how we can overcome the enemy. And some of the favorite reading for me is going through the stories in the Old Testament of the various kings and the various battles because you learn lessons that prepare you and how to fight against the battles that come to us as Christians. And we may consider some of those along the way. All right, why are we at war? Where did it all begin? How did, we didn't ask to be enlisted as soldiers. We were drafted from the time we were born. And you were drafted again when you were born again. It started in heaven. You know, the Bible says in Ephesians, these are spiritual powers in heavenly places. Revelation 12, verse 7, a war broke out in heaven. There you have it. A war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. Now I want to pause here and just get you to think about something. Who is stronger, Christ or Satan? Christ. Jesus. The Creator has to be stronger than the creation, right? Um, why did they have to fight? Couldn't Jesus have just said, be gone? And Satan and his angels would just have to leave. But somehow, God allowed his natural laws of cause and effect to play out, and it turned into a battle angel on angel. Why did he let it happen that way? Hold that thought, and I'm going to elaborate on it a little later, but it was a war. Now, if they had to fight a real war in heaven, we're probably not getting off the hook here because the war has moved from there to here. Satan was cast out. I'm in verse 9. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So we're down here with angels that have been expelled. Satan has basically hijacked and kidnapped the planet. Even Jesus said in Luke 10, 18, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. He's come to the earth. And Revelation warns us, chapter 12, verse 12, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Why are they rejoicing? Satan's been cast out. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Why? Because he's been cast in. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows he has a short time. Satan right now claims he is a prince of this world. Indeed, even Jesus said, the prince of this world comes. He is called the prince of the power of the air by Paul. And so the devil claims this is his dominion. So when you say, I do not recognize your dominion, I serve another king, you become a target of the devil. Now how many of you would like to get the devil's attention? Every hand should have gone up. Think about it. When you say, I don't want the devil's attention, you're saying, I don't want to cause any problems for him. But if you want to please the Lord, then you need to resist him. Isn't that right? And give him a hard time. But we already have enough problems from the devil. We're thinking, I don't want to invite more trouble. But there's no third, you can't go to Switzerland, friends, I'm sorry. There's no neutral country. The only way that you escape being enlisted in the army of God is when you die or Jesus comes. Until then, you are going to be in a battle. The good thing about a battle is a battle is not a whole war. There are breaks between battles. You know, the um, pilots sometimes say being an airline pilot is unending hours of monotony punctuated with moments of terror. And being a soldier is something like that too. There are spells of monotony that are punctuated with the terror of battle. And then you wait and wait and wait. You hurry up and you wait. Any of you in the military? 
You do all this preparation, you hurry up, and then you wait. It's monotony. So there fortunately are some breaks. And what are you supposed to do on those breaks between battles? Take it easy or clean your rifle and be prepared. Sharpen your sword. Be prepared for what's coming. This is what Paul is telling us in Ephesians. And you read in the last verse, I mean, still in Revelation 12, verse 17, the dragon was enraged with the woman. Who's the woman? The church. That's Christ's children. Every believer. He is what? He's enraged. And he went to make, what's that three-letter word? War. The devil went to make war with the rest of her offspring. And they're identified by those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Some Christians do not feel any war because they don't keep the commandments and the devil's not enraged with them. So I ask you again, how many of you want to make the devil mad? Oh, you're getting the idea. How many of you want to make the, the Lord glad? You got to choose. Make the devil mad, make the Lord glad. Or vice versa. I don't want the wrath of the Lamb. Now when we talk about the war, there are really two different aspects of the war. You've got uh, the internal war and the external war, even in spiritual warfare. You've got, in any war, you've got offense and defense. Uh, some wars in the Bible were fought where they were defending their city because they were attacked from the outside and they're just trying to maintain survival. Other times, like when Joshua went into the promised land, they went out conquering and to conquer. That's a quote from uh, Revelation. So they were told to take this territory that belonged to them. As a Christian, we're involved in both office, offense and defense. A lot of us are always on the defense. We're so worried about being overcome by the enemy that we're always thinking, you know, how can I resist temptation? But you don't want to stop there because as a Christian you're also wanting to go out and conquer for Christ to reach other people. A biblical war that helps to give that uh, dual nature here. Genesis 14, 14, you know the story. Lot and his family living in Sodom is a bad place to set up house. Uh, they are attacked by Chedorlaomer and these five kings from the north. And they come down and they kidnap, they seize all the people from Sodom and Gomorrah and those cities of the plain. They take them back up towards Damascus. Abraham gets word of it. And it says in Genesis 14, 14, Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive. It's actually his nephew. He armed his 318 trained servants. He must have had a big household because he's got 300 that are trained with war. How do you like that? Abraham, what's his job? General Abraham? You ever call him General Abraham? No. Captain? Sergeant Abraham? No. We're saying Shepherd Abraham. But he knew in order to have peace he needed to be prepared for war. So before Lot was ever taken captive he had 318 in his household that were ready to fight. So are you training for battle? He was sharpening the sword of the word. He took his soldiers that were trained, born in his own house, and he went in pursuit as far as Dan, that's way up in the north. And he divided his forces against them by night. He knew something about uh, military strategy. And he and his servants attacked them. You know the most important element in battle? Surprise. Surprise. He attacked them by night. And he pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. So he brought back all of the goods and all of, he brought back his brother Lot and all the goods as well as the women and the people. So Abraham was not just content to defend his, his little enclave, but he went out and he rescued those who were captive. These are the two ways that we do battle spiritually, is we're trying to keep from being uh, taken ourselves and we want to rescue those who are taken captive by the enemy. That's why we're involved in a church, to help people maintain and to help them in outreach. It's in reach and it's outreach. Amen? So let's talk a little bit about this inner war that we all deal with. 1 Peter 2, 11, let's establish there is a war. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims. You know what a sojourner and a pilgrim is? Someone traveling through. You're, this is not full time. This world is not our home. Soldiers are often on the move. I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts 
that war against the soul. When we give in to the desires of the flesh, it wars against you spiritually. It consumes you. It's like a cancer spiritually. God does not want us to be controlled by the flesh. You got two natures at war. You got the spirit and the flesh. And if we're always catering to the flesh, wanting to always do everything for our own ease, we don't practice self-denial, then you end up being controlled by the flesh instead of by the spirit. And you're losing the spiritual war. James 4.1 where do wars and fightings come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? Your members, doesn't talk about church members or Costco members. It's talking about the members of your body, uh, in your heart, your hand, your head, your feet, your, within you. There's a war going on and between the spirit and the flesh. Galatians 5.17 For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another, like oil and water. You, they don't get along. You can't say, I want to be spiritually and fleshly minded at the same time. It's not going to happen. It's one or the other. And if you want to serve God, you've got to say, Lord, I want to be led by your spirit. And you must fight against and resist the controlling carnal nature. Now, you know, the problem is you've got both. As long as you're in this world, you're going to be part animal. That's the carnal, the flesh. In Spanish, the way you say meat is carne, right? Have you ever been to a carnival? You know where it gets its word? The Roman Colosseums, they had these circuses that were so brutal and bloodthirsty that it, it, the flesh was everywhere. It comes from the Latin word meaning carne, carnage. You ever use that word? And so it gives you, when you go to the California State Fair, just think carnival. <laughs> Next, I ruined it for you, didn't I? <clears throat> that was my plan. So the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, they're contrary to one another. So you do not do the things you wish. Whenever we fall, it's because this is war going on. Now I'm going to venture on dangerous ground. Romans chapter 7. Paul talks about this. For I know that in me, in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For the will, in my mind, I want to do the will of God, is present with me. But how to perform what is good, I don't find. It's not natural. For the good that I will to do, I do not. But the evil I do not, that I practice. Now if I do not what I will not to do, it's no longer I, but sin that dwells in me. We just get these sinful natures that are always gravitating towards the selfish things and the, the carnal nature of the flesh. I find in a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, meaning the spiritual man, in my heart. But I see another law, it's that carnal nature, in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me in captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Now the good news is, if you go to Romans chapter 8, he says, who will deliver me from this body of death? Now this isn't pretty, but... One of the things ancient generals would do, or kings, when they captured and conquered someone, if they wanted them to die just the very worst death, they would not only imprison them, but they would chain them to a dead body. Uh, that's a horrific thought. They'd chain it to their back, and they'd make them bear that in the jail. And while this dead body was there putrefying, it would, the contagion would eventually permeate themselves, and they would be killed by it. Um, I know it's an ugly picture. That's what Paul says. I have to tell you. That's what he means. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Wouldn't that be terrible if you had to carry around a dying, decomposing corpse on your body? It's kind of the way Paul describes this carnal nature. We've all got this uh, fleshly side that's just selfish. We're wanting to do what is good for us. We're wanting, it's controlled by pride. That's how the devil fell. It's controlled by satisfying our own desires, putting ourself first. It's controlled by selfishness. And yet you say, I want to be like Jesus. But I got this nature, this, <laughs> this corpse <laughs> that is dragging me down all the time. Who will deliver me from this? And the answer is given in chapter 8. Thank God, through Jesus Christ, we no longer have to walk after the flesh but we can now walk by the Spirit. You can live a new spiritual life. 
There's a story in the Bible where this man is on a bed. He can't do anything. He's controlled by this bed. He's crippled. He's paralyzed. He gets four friends to bring him to Jesus. They finally lower him through the roof into the presence of Jesus. Jesus forgives his sin and then he heals him. He says, take up your bed and go to your house. Now that man was so tired of that dirty bed that carried him around. But after Jesus healed him, does he still have his bed? He does. You know what the difference is? When he came to Christ, the bed carried him. After Jesus set him free, he carried the bed. Once you come to Jesus, you may still have sinful desires, but they don't have dominion over you anymore. Sin shall no longer have dominion over you. The Lord rules in your life. Doesn't mean Christians don't fall. We don't struggle. And when we do, we know how Paul feels when he describes the thing I don't want to do, I do. But right away, we should repent and turn from those things and ask God to help us really be led by the Spirit and walk by the Spirit. Amen? And Paul goes on to say in Ephesians 6, For we, he's including himself, do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Don't you wish you could just punch the devil in the nose? You could go, you know, take a, take a course in kickboxing or something and fight the devil. It's not that easy. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So, what are some of the ways that uh, we can overcome? Well, first of all, soldiers need discipline. One of the most important things that uh, happened in my life was, I remember, <laughs> I was uh, talking to my mom. I had a friend I'd visited. Actually, I just reconnected with him after 50 years. And uh, he had been to New York Military Academy, and he had his first year there, and he said it was great. And he was telling me, he and his brother Danny, Danny and Bobby, went to military school, and they were our best friends. They told us how wonderful it was. I said, Mom, that's what I need. I was in trouble in school all the time. And not having a father in the home, my mom raising, we were in trouble. Moms aren't always the disciplinarians that dad is. And I thought, I said, I need discipline. I was young enough, I was only like 11, but I knew I'm out of control. Uh, mom's letting me get away with way too much. I see my friends and their parents and how they act. I said, you know, I need discipline. I knew that. I said, I said, mom, I said, this is the thing. It might be my last chance. That's what I told her. I said, this might be my last chance. I said, you need to send me to NEMA, New York Military Academy, by the way, which is where Donald Trump went. But I didn't know him, because he's older than I am. I want you to know that. <laughs> and um, so she sent me. I went there for two years. And you know what? Boy, I cried, and I felt so sorry for myself, and I was homesick, and they used to beat you there. That was before it was illegal. Yeah, you, when I would say beat you, they didn't just beat you. I mean, but you misbehaved, they'd hit you. They'd lay you across the desk. They'd whip you with a belt. I mean, it was rough. And they, we couldn't act like little boys. I mean, we had to march everywhere, and there was a rules about everything, and you had to make your bed, and if it wasn't made, they'd tear it apart and say, make it again. And, <laughs> I felt so sorry for myself. And, but you know what? Through all that misery, I was learning. It was boot camp. And your first year there, you're called a newbie. And to this day, every time anybody that had been there longer stopped me, they, they say, newbie. And I'd go, hey, sir, new sir, guy, sir, is sir, thus sir, scum, sir, of sir, thus sir, earth, sir, sir. Did you know what I said? You used to say, a new guy is the scum of the earth. I am, you have to say that. It was humiliating. You had to stand at attention like this and repeat that. Or you get punished even worse. And there's reasons why they do the things they do in the military. They are teaching discipline. They're teaching obedience. They're teaching self-control. They're teaching self-denial. Because when those soldiers are two or three days without sleep fighting, you better, you can't go, I want to go home. You, you got to learn how to toughen it up. And this is why Paul says to Timothy, you've got to learn to endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ. The truth be known, the church is really soft. There is very little self-denial. There is very little discipline in the church. You don't hear much about fasting and self-denial, and prayer, and, and going out and, and sharing and distributing literature or, or visiting others when you don't feel like it. We're being taught to be a very selfish, feel-good church. 
Pastors go out to raise a church in the community and they'll do a survey and find out what does everybody in this community want? They want donuts? Let's give them donuts. And you raise up a church of people that like donuts. And they don't learn about taking up a cross and following Christ and fighting battles and being soldiers. We've gotten soft. So soul, you need discipline if you're going to be a soldier. Numbers 32, verse 6, Moses said to the children of Gad and the children of Reuben, will your brethren go to war while you sit here? We've got a lot of churches that are just sitting there while everyone else is going to war. 1 Corinthians 9, 26, therefore, Paul said, I run not with uncertainty, I fight not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others I myself should be overcome or disqualified. Every Christian, we need a Christian boot camp these days. Soldiers need courage. We need strong morale. We need to believe in what we're doing. We need to believe we're going to win. If the devil can discourage us and make us lose faith, faith is everything for the Christian. That's the morale I'm talking about, right? right. You know the story where Caleb went before the children of Israel with Joshua and ten other spies and they did reconnaissance in the promised land. They came back and Joshua and Caleb said, let us go at once into this land flowing with milk and honey. We can take them. They're nothing. We can beat them. And the other ten said, oh no. They're too big. They're too strong in the walls and their armaments. And we were like grasshoppers. And they discouraged the children of Israel. They lost morale and you can't fight like that. They wandered forty years. Why? lost faith. You need to have courage. Notice what happens after 40 years go by. Now Joshua is getting ready to enter the promised land again. Joshua who was a spy, he's now the commander. Listen to what God says to Joshua. Chapter 1 verse 5. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and good of good courage. For this people will divide an inheritance in the land that I swore to their fathers, I promised to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, that you might do all according to the law that Moses my servant commanded you. Have not I commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. The Lord your God is with you. What is God trying to say to Joshua? Don't make that mistake of losing faith they made 40 years earlier. You can whip them. Amen. And did they? They won every battle except the battle with Ai because there was an Achan in the camp. And that was a pretty, they lost 36 men. But they won every other battle uh, because they had courage. So God wants us to have that kind of courage. You know before the children of Israel would go into battle, Moses said the priests will stand before the soldiers. Before they go into battle they'd make an, an announcement. And the priest would say, what man is there here who is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return to his house, lest the heart of his brethren faint like his heart in the battle. If you're going to stick around and be, oh me, oh my, I can't be a Christian, I'm going to get overcome, and who can be a Christian? Who can walk holy? It's not possible. You're just going to discourage everybody else. What we need is more people that say, yes you can. Give testimonies of how God has given us victory. Encourage everybody else that you can be victorious. Instead of hearing all these sermons and testimonies about how I overcome, but thank you for His grace. I mean, I, I appreciate His grace. You know what I'm talking about? Is everybody's highlighting their overcoming. We're not highlighting any victories. I don't want to be a soldier that loses, do you? We want to, we want to believe in the victory. Something else very important when it comes to uh, a battle is communications. You know, uh, the first thing that happened during the Gulf War is when we were trying to take on Baghdad and uh, they maybe didn't have weapons of mass destruction but they definitely were gassing people. I mean, that, Saddam Hussein was not a good dude, you know that. And they were torturing people and doing terrible things. So when they attacked, they took out their communication facilities. First thing they did, they blasted the radios, they blasted the antennas, and pretty soon they couldn't talk to each other. And if you can knock out their communications, they don't know what the orders are, they don't know what to do, and they crumble. You know what the devil tries to do with us? Knock out our communications. If we're not 
in contact with our commander, there's confusion. We need to daily, regularly be talking to the Lord. 1 Corinthians 14.8 If the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for the battle? You know, back in battle times, right next to the commander was a guy with a trumpet and he would give the different signals telling the troops what to do. You've probably all seen the cowboy and Indian movie where when it looks like the fort is going to fall and everything's hopeless for the settlers, all of a sudden off in the distance you hear a bugle it means all oh, the cavalry's coming to rescue us. That was the bugle sound for charge. And if you're in the military, you used to go to sleep at night, you'd hear what's that called? They played that over the loudspeaker every day in our military school and in the morning the most annoying sound I ever heard was <laughs> every morning on the loudspeaker they'd play Rivoli. Well they also had signals for flank right, flank left, retreat, they had the bugler was given the signal. Well the military knew if you can knock out the bugler the bugler would stay as close to the captain, he was usually pretty safe. But if you could knock out the bugler, there'd be chaos on the field. Because the communications broke down. That's why the Bible says, that you smite the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. And if we don't pray, Ephesians 6.18, talking about the spiritual warfare, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Not just praying for ourselves, but praying for the saints. Soldiers must watch. Talked about communications. I just mentioned watchful to this end. Ezekiel 33. So you, son of man, I have made a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore you shall hear the word from my mouth and warn them from me. Over and over again, Jesus tells us about the importance of being watchful. Watch and pray. When does the devil attack? You know, it's often after a victory the devil attacks. Or he attacks you when you're tired, hungry. And these are the moments when you're not suspecting and you're the most vulnerable. When did he come to Jesus? 40 days of fasting. When did he come to David? After victory over all the nations? David's just letting Joab mop up and he's on his palace roof. He's victorious. And there's Bathsheba. Now that was a spiritual war. It started as a spiritual war that manifested itself in the physical. Somebody, some demon told Bathsheba, I know it's broad daylight, but most of the soldiers are gone. Go take a bath in the courtyard. And another devil said, David, why don't you go out and get some fresh air? And I'm sure that was all orchestrated by evil spirits in heavenly places, so to speak. And so uh, you need to be watchful. Because the devil is always working to bring us down. Mark 13, 33. Take heed, Jesus said. Watch and pray. How do we watch? He tells us. Pray. For you do not know what that time is. It's like a man going into a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants to each one his work. And he commanded the doorkeeper, whether it's a guard on the tower or a doorkeeper, watch. Verse 35. Watch therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, or at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all. Last words Jesus say, watch. He said, watch, watch, watch. And what does he mean watch? Mark 14, 38, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. So how do we keep from temptation? We watch through prayer. Be sober, be vigilant through prayer. Praying, how often Paul said, praying always. Being in an attitude of prayer. Constant communion with God. You know it's hard to sin when you're talking to God. Next time you're tempted, get on your knees and pray and you're going to find it very hard to give, give in. You know what your biggest battle is going to be? I don't know if I want to pray. Bible says we're supposed to run from temptation but most of us crawl hoping it catches us. If you choose and make up your mind to pray when you know you're being tempted, you're going to find it's a lot easier to overcome because God will draw near. And who wants to sin in the presence of God? That's very uncomfortable, right? Draw close to God and it'll give you the strength. So that's how we watch and pray. 
Now, it looks like time permits for me to take you to another example of how this plays out. Prayer wins spiritual wars. Spiritual wars are won and lost often through prayer. If you go to Daniel chapter 10 for just a minute, I'm going to look at three verses here. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Daniel 10. In the beginning of the chapter, we find that Daniel is fasting and praying. He's doing a simple fast. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. He was mourning over the condition of Israel. He was mourning over what was going to happen to the people of God he had heard from through the uh, visions. I ate no pleasant food, nor meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. So he humbles himself. Daniel is fasting and praying for how long? Three weeks. And he's praying for God's people because the prince of Persia, the king of Persia, was supposed to, Cyrus, let the people go back to Jerusalem. It hadn't happened yet. Daniel 10 verse 12, an angel appears and says, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. An angel comes 21 days later, but he comes because of Daniel's prayer. But the angel goes on, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. Now, who can withstand an angel? He's not talking about Cyrus. He's talking about the devil. See, in the same way that it was the devil that told Herod to kill the babies in Bethlehem, you can often see through history it was the devil that worked behind the king of Tyre in chapter 14 of Isaiah, and, or the king of Babylon. And in uh, Ezekiel, it's the king of Tyre, is it's the devil behind them all. So it's saying the devil resisted me. This I think is very interesting. Well, he withstood me how long? 21 days. How long was Daniel praying? 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, and many believe that Michael is another word for Christ. It's Christ pre-incarnation. He is the son of God. And when it says chief princes, it means chief or the highest of, uh, of all, came to help me, for I had been left alone with the kings of Persia. Now, why would it take an angel 21 days? Why does Michael need to be called? Notice this, Daniel 10 verse 20. Then he said to me, do you not know why I have come to you? Now I must return and fight with the prince of Persia. This is an angel talking. For I have gone forth, indeed the prince of Greece will come. So you get the picture here? There's a battle in heavenly places. Daniel is praying that the Holy Spirit and providence will move uh, the king of Persia, Cyrus, to finally let the people go back to the promised land and fulfill their destiny. And the devil is resisting that happening and the angels are fighting against the devil and it doesn't just happen like that. I don't know what they're doing up there in heavenly places but those fallen angels have some power. Fortunately there's twice as many good angels as bad angels. I think if our eyes were open right now and we could see the battles raging in heavenly places for our souls it would terrify us. We'd pray more, I promise you that, if you saw the kind of battles that are fighting uh, for us, we'd pray more. David, once a plague was going through Jerusalem, and David's wondering what's going on. He looks above Jerusalem, God opens his eyes, he sees an angel with a sword in his hand because of the pride and the sin of David and the people. A judgment's going through the land. All they see on the ground is the plague. David sees the angel in the air. So there are spiritual things that are happening. And so... I always thought it was amazing that three weeks go by and he says, and the battle's not over yet. We've got to go back and fight against these spiritual forces. I always thought, oh, good angels, slam dunk. They can wipe out an evil angel right away. Not so easy in the Bible. There's something going on. You know what made the difference in um, this prayer being answered? Daniel praying 31 days, moved the hand of heaven and a nation was released from bondage, but it wasn't without a struggle. I just summarized what I read. Daniel praying, a one person on earth, fasting and praying, mobilized angels in heaven to come and to strive with the evil angels that were manipulating the powers of earth until finally Cyrus let the people go home. Would God we had more people on earth praying. Amen? Yes. To move things in heaven. There are battles that are going on. 
Something else about an army. Do you know an army marches on its stomach? You ever heard that? They don't march on their feet. They march on their stomach. You stop feeding soldiers and you watch what happens. They can't fight. I remember reading in the Bible that uh, 1 Samuel 30, David went and his 600 men who were with him, they came to the brook Besor. They're trying to rescue their families that have been kidnapped by the Amalekites. And they left some behind. David pursued, he and 400 men. For 200 stayed behind. They were so weary they could not cross the brook. They were actually malnourished. You read in 1 Samuel 14, Saul, King Saul made a really dumb order. He said, do not eat until I've been avenged of my enemies. And the soldiers are fighting the Philistines. They won the first battle, but then they got hungry. And they couldn't fight anymore. Jonathan saw some honey on the ground. He ate the honey and he said, look how my, my strength and my blood sugar has been revived so I can keep fighting just from a little honey. You should have let the soldiers eat. We would have had a bigger victory. You know how the devil tries to overcome the church? You can read in 2 Kings chapter 6, it says that the king of Syria surrounded the Israelites in the north and he starved them through besieging the city so they couldn't fight. He starved them so they couldn't fight. Now what am I talking about when I say a, an army marches on its stomach? The bread of life. If you want to be able to fight, you need to feed. I saw there was a National Geographic uh, article talked about the bull moose in, in uh, Alaska and in Canada that, you know, they, they get into a big fight in the fall about who's going to be the big moose and get all the, the does. Is that what they call the female moose? The moosettes? And uh, the, the male moose, they go at it and they use their horns as a principal weapon. And whoever has got the most bulk and whoever has the biggest horns usually is the big moose, is the bull moose. And you know how they get the big horns in the bulk? They eat the best food during the summer. Then they're able to fight and win when the battle comes. Uh, you and I, if we are feeding our souls now with the best food, we're going to have the spiritual strength to fight when the battle comes. Can you say amen if that made sense? How many of you ever eat canned food? Any canned food? You ever open a can? How many opened a can in the last week? Do you know why we have canned food? Because Napoleon was losing his battle with Russia because he could not get food to his soldiers without it spoiling first. He offered an award of, I think it was 12,000 francs, if someone could invent a way of preserving the food better for his troops, because an army marches on its stomach. And along came Nicholas apart. He was a confectionery. <laughs> and uh, he found that if he used wine bottles, and he boiled the food. He didn't even understand Louis Pasteur's bacteria, but he just found that it worked. That if he boiled the vegetables and then corked them, and they were putting fruit and peas and and I wish they'd never invented the canned peas, but they, the the fruit and the peas and the different things in the bottles, and it worked. And he ended up getting the award. And it was because you got canned food because Napoleon offered a reward to someone who could help his army march. Daniel came back from the Marines and he brought home some of his MREs. You ever eat an MRE? <laughs> Meals ready to eat? They've gotten much better, I understand, but it's designed to last. Well, you and I cannot depend on prepackaged food. We need fresh bread every day from the Word of God. Jesus said, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, I don't want to discourage you when I talk about war. And you think, oh man, don't I get peace? Do you know, you can enjoy peace even in the midst of war. Um, David, who wrote a lot of the Psalms, spent a lot of his life in war. Do you realize David had war with the Philistines? With the Moabites. With the Ammonites. With the Amalekites. With the Edomites. With the Assyrians. Uh, David fought on every front through his life, and he had wars with his own family. Friendly fire. You want to hear a funny story? Somebody in Seattle a few years ago stole a police car, and they realized it, and they put out, you know, a cop walks out of the coffee shop, and his car's gone, and they put out an all-points bulletin, and all these police cars were chasing down this stolen police car. And one of the cars saw the car and be 
began to make chase through the city of Seattle and the car got through an intersection, the light changed, and other cars were, they couldn't, they had to stop at the light. Well, other cars that had gotten the call, they came ahead, they thought that this was a car that had been stolen. So they rammed their fellow officers. Well, the fellow officers, they thought the guy who had stolen the car had gone around the block and rear-ended them and they thought, we're under attack. So they jumped out of the car and started to fire at them. And then the other police began to fire at the ones they just rammed. And they exchanged 20 rounds. It's a miracle nobody was killed. Before they realized they were shooting at each other. You know why the church is not doing more to conquer for Christ? Is we're all firing at each other. Friendly fire. David fought a lot of battles in friendly fire. But I said all that because even though David's life was surrounded by war, he wrote the most beautiful psalms on peace. You can have peace in the midst of a war. And I was reading about Stonewall Jackson, an interesting man during the Civil War. He never seemed to be afraid during battle. Matter of fact, that's how he got his name. His name was John. But uh, during a battle, bullets flying everywhere. He's going back and forth up on the hill. Uh, well, surveying his troops and giving orders, standing high in the saddle, looking so calm, and everyone says, look, he's up there on the hill like a stone wall. We can't get past him. Got the name Stonewall Jackson. And they asked him, why aren't you afraid? He always explained extraordinary calm under fire. He said, my religious belief teaches me to feel as safe in battle as in bed. If you're a Christian and you're fighting side by side with King David, you have nothing to fear. You know, I told you, the battles in the Bible inspire me. I remember one battle where all the troops retreated. They were fighting the Philistines over a, a field of barley, and, and uh, all the troops retreated, except David would not retreat. And one of his mighty men named Eliezer, I never could forget his name, it's Eliezer, the son of Dodo. And look it up. <laughs> There's not many soldiers like that around anymore because they're extinct. But uh, Eliezer, he saw that David was not retreating and he went and he stood back to back with David and it says David and Eliezer stayed when all the other soldiers retreated and they defeated the Philistines single-handedly. If you're fighting side by side with David, you don't lose. Do you know David never lost a battle? I told you Joshua lost one. David never lost one. You can't name one battle. All those wars. Because he, from the time of Goliath, until he closed his eyes, he said... I'm not coming against you in my own strength. I'm coming against you in the strength of the Lord. And God gave him victory. Now, Jesus is called the son of David. And if we are fighting side by side with Jesus, do we need to live lives of fear? Can we still have peace? Jesus has never lost a battle. Follow our commander. John 3, 8. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Jesus is going to win. John 4.4, 4, you've got to remember, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I told you the devil and his forces have real power, but there's no question who's going to win. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 10. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into the captivity of the obedience of Christ. How do we win these battles? Bringing every thought into the captivity of Christ, asking for the Lord to give us a new heart and new mind. Amen? And then we don't have to be afraid. You know, the Salvation Army was formed by a pastor named William Booth. He saw all the, the poor people on the streets and the derelicts and the prostitutes and everybody, all the fine people were in the churches. His heart went out. He said, Jesus spent his time reaching the poor, reaching the sinners. And he used the, some untraditional methods. He went out there and was just preaching the gospel on the street. It was looked down upon by the clergymen in the church. I thought this is a little unconventional. But he and his wife, Catherine, they started to withdraw from the formal churches and they trained evangelists to go throughout England. They returned to East London in 1865 where many followers joined in their fight for souls 
of lost men and women. Within 10 years, their organization, operating under the name Christian Mission, had a thousand volunteers and evangelists. Thieves, prostitutes, gamblers, drunkards were among their first converts, and these converts were then sent out preaching, and they were singing in the streets as living testimonies to the power of God. Then William Booth read a printer's proof of an 1878 Christian Mission annual report. He noticed a statement, the Christian Mission is a volunteer army. Booth looked at that volunteer army. He crossed out the word volunteer, and he put in the word salvation army. And from those words came the basis for what the Salvation Army became. In its heyday, there in England, they had converted 250,000 Christians between 1881 and 1885. Boy, talk about a revival. That's a quarter of a million people. That's just in England. And if you want some entertainment, you look online under the Salvation Army hymnal, they got like 600 songs that are all about fighting because <laughs> they said, we are in a war. They understood, we're in a war against sin. These people were captive by the devil. And it's not just on the streets of London or in downtown Sacramento, but even in churches, there's battles going on for souls. We're battling against sin. And Jesus said that he can save us from our sins. Uh, the weapons of our warfare are mighty. Through prayer, fortifying our minds with the strength of His Word, through watching, through sharing our faith with others, you will be strengthened as you share your faith in your own convictions. We can have the ultimate victory. Don't forget to request today's life-changing free resource. Not only can you receive this free gift in the mail, you can download a digital copy straight to your computer or mobile device. To get your digital copy of today's free gift, simply text the keyword on your screen to 40544 or visit the web address shown on your screen and be sure to select the digital download option on the request page. It's now easier than ever for you to study God's Word with amazing facts wherever and whenever you want and most important, to share it with others. Let's face it, it's not always easy to understand everything you read in the Bible. With over 700,000 words contained in 66 books, the Bible can generate a lot of questions. To get biblical, straightforward answers, call into Bible Answers Live, a live nationwide call-in radio program where you can talk to Pastor Doug Batchelor and ask him your most difficult Bible questions. For times and stations in your area or to listen to answers online, visit bal.amazingfacts.org. Did you know Amazing Facts has a free Bible school that you can do from the comfort of your own home? It includes 27 beautifully illustrated study lessons to aid in your study of God's Word. Sign up today for this free Bible study course by calling 1-844-215-7000. That's 1-844-215-7000. Don't forget to request today's free offer. It's sure to be a blessing. And thank you for your continued support as we take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. We hope you'll join us next week as we delve deep into the Word of God to explore more amazing facts. This is really the second part in a series I began last week, except when I began last week, I didn't know it would be a series until I ran out of time and I had half the sermon left. So uh, rather than keep you for two hours, I decided to uh, turn it into a two-part series where we're talking about spiritual warfare. And in, in particular today, we're going to be dealing with the subject of the armor of God, hence my friend to my left who is not a perfect representation of what we're going to discuss today, but it's the best I could do in short notice. My other Bible armor is all packed up in a container over at the Amazing Facts property preparing to move. And so uh, I couldn't find a shield for this guy, so you're just going to have to use your imagination. You know, it, it can mean the difference between life and death if you are wearing the right thing for the right task. You know, all kinds of different clothing is used for different functions. And I'm going to have just an example or two of some of the 
uh, things that people wear. Of course, a firefighter, he has special garments that he wears for fighting a fire. Wearing them can save your life. Now, if someone wearing a hazmat suit shows up to your house, you're not going to have a good day. I just want to tell you right now. Not only do they have suits that uh, keep something on the outside from getting in, but uh, these suits keep something from the inside from getting out. If you work in a highly sophisticated technical computer environment, you're wearing a suit that keeps your skin flakes and hair and things like that from contaminating the computer chips. But again, they have special garments. Uh, when you've got the Ebola problem over there in West Central Africa, you've got to have the right clothing on or you could die. And then there's environments that are extreme, such as the deep sea, and without these suits, this is uh, a um, what, saturated oxygen diving suit. They go down the hundreds of feet, and if there's any break in the suit, they don't make it. And then, of course, if you go up in the opposite direction into space, we know how critical it is that they wear the right gear or they cannot survive. And that's how it is in the Christian life. You know, there's a lot of metaphors that are used in the Bible. Oh, I forgot the soldiers, sorry. Of course, our good soldiers, they've got to wear the protective gear, and that probably segues uh, very well into what we need to talk about today. Paul and others, when they talk about living the Christian life, they talk about boxing. Christian life is like a race. Jesus said it's like farming. Jesus said it's like shepherding. Peter said it's like climbing a ladder. A Christian life has uh, a lot of metaphors. Um, it's like fishing. Paul especially liked to say the Christian life is to be compared to a battle. It's a war, and we are soldiers in that battle. Now, I think that's a great metaphor. Paul knew the Old Testament very well, and from cover to cover in the Bible, you find examples, especially the Old Testament, of occupation and battles and war and fighting. Everything from the one-on-one -on -one battle of David and Goliath to entire armies that clashed. And we are engaged in a battle, but it is a spiritual battle. We are engaged in warfare. If you do not feel the warfare, it could be because you've just grown comfortable living as a POW in occupied country. But if you try to be free of that uh, enemy, then you're going to feel it. We're all engaged in a war. Uh, every believer battles with Satan. Now, believers may be harassed by the devil, but believers are not possessed by the devil. I every now and then hear some radio pastor is saying, yeah, we got different believers here and they're struggling with demon possession. I go, ah, <laughs> I don't see that in the Bible. Uh, demons might harass, but if you're possessed, you're probably not a Christian. Um, you might believe in God and be possessed. A lot of the de demons that followed after Jesus said, we know who you are, son of God. But uh, if you're a believer, you may be harassed. Was Peter tempted by the devil? Jesus turned to Peter one time and said, Satan, get behind me. <laughs> he was being harassed by the devil. And uh, then Jesus said to, Satan, to Peter, Satan has desired to have you, that uh, he might sift you. Now there's two kinds of people in the world. You've got people on God's side that are being stalked by the devil, and you have people on the devil's side that are being stalked by the Lord. He's trying to rescue them. And so there's a great conflict that's going on and the battlefield is the hearts of humans. The devil is not trying to, you know, win some acreage out in Montana. The devil is trying to get acreage in your heart and in your mind. And this is where these spiritual battles rage. And so the Bible tells us that God is offering us something to help win in that battle. You read in 2 Timothy 2, verse 3 and 4, You therefore, my son, you must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he might please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Soldiers were often on the move as they were fighting and going from place to place and fighting battles, and they didn't have time <laughs> to develop long-term 
relationships could, they could be easily transferred from place to place and be sent out. We need to see ourselves as soldiers for God. And we have special weapons. You read here in 2 Corinthians 10, 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God, pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So you already knew this, but in the battle, we're battling in our thoughts. We're fighting a spiritual battle. It's very real. You're thinking real thoughts even now. And the battle is happening usually in our minds. And but the, we, we have some armor that God's provided. Now Paul, the apostle, I think one reason he used this analogy of the armor of God is few people saw more Roman armor than Paul. Paul spent a lot of time in prison with prison guards outside the doors. Paul went on a cruise where he was chained. You read the last chapters in Acts. He's basically assigned a soldier that guards him all along the way. Paul was uh, a prisoner with a certain amount of freedom, but he was on house arrest in Rome for two years. Probably when Paul wrote the book of Ephesians, he was a prisoner. And while he's writing about the armor of God, he's got a Roman soldier exhibit A right there that he could look at. And so go with me to Ephesians 6 verse 10, and we're going to take a closer look at the armor of God here. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10. He's concluding the book, and he wants the people to be successful and victorious. And he says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord in the power of of his might. Same kind of admonition that God gave to Joshua saying, be courageous. Put on the whole armor of God. Now it's not enough to just put on some of the armor, but we need to put on all the armor. Now when I first started doing this sermon on the armor of God, I've been sharing it for years, I thought, well, to be a good pastor, I'm going to look at all the Bible references to armor, see what I can learn. Well, I read that David, when uh, Saul gave David his armor, it didn't fit right, and, and David couldn't use it, and he threw it aside and said to Saul, I've not proved these, and I thought, well, that's not going to help me. It was bad armor. And then I read about um, Ahab. He went into battle wearing his armor, and he thought it was going to save him against the Syrians, but a, a stray arrow ricocheted off something and came down and hit him in the joint of the armor. One little vulnerable spot cut a major artery and he bled to death. So well, that armor didn't help him very much. This isn't going well for my sermon. <laughs> and then I thought about uh, the different ones in the Bible that went into battle with armors and they died. And I thought, oh, good Lord, help me understand. And God said, Doug, you're, you're looking at all wrong. I'm not saying put on the armor of men. You're looking at all the armor of men. I'm saying put on the armor of God. That armor does not fail. It says, put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, the cunning of the devil, the sneakiness of the devil. So we're wanting this armor because the devil is using his stratagem to tempt us, to discourage us, to mislead us, to confuse us. And we need the armor to protect us in our thinking that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. The devil is called the prince of the power of the air. There's a whole dimension of angels and a spirit world around us. The angels see each other. The good angels see the bad angels and vice versa and they fight and we don't know what kind of wrestling or battling they do or how they do that and some of these things are going to probably be unveiled in the resurrection when we get our spiritual natures back, our spiritual dimension back I should say. But there's a whole world, uh, an angelic world where there are good and evil angels and evidently there are different ranks. We know the devil outranks the others, and uh, like any army, there are probably different divisions and different ranks and different authorities, and they may have, you can read in the books of Ezekiel 
in Isaiah where it talks about these devils that are battling with the kings of Tyre and Babylon. You read in Daniel the king of Persia. There may be different ranking devils that do this. Typically when the average person says the devil is tempting me, you're flattering yourself. Now the devil is not all knowing. He's not omnipresent. But he has demons that work under him. And I don't know what the name would be of your particular demon but we're typically talking about fallen angels that have been assigned to the sons of men to try to deceive and discourage and they study your weaknesses and, and uh, uh, C.S. Lewis, how many of you have read the screw tape letters? <laughs> then you know what I'm talking about. I think he actually has some good insights there about how, how there's this battle going on and they're studying us to bring us down and they're fighting against the power of God who's trying to redeem us. And our only safeguard is in putting on the armor of God. Because your death and destruction is his objective. Now the devil is called the accuser of the brethren. He stood there in, in Zechariah and he accuses Joshua the high priest. And you can see in the book of Jude when Christ is coming to resurrect Moses. The devil says you can't have him. He sinned. And there's, a, there's an argument that's going on. There's a contest. It's like a court case. And the devil is trying to keep God from saving people because misery loves country, company. Devils come down with great wrath because his time is short. But there is a very real battle that goes on in our minds between the attitudes of the devil and the spirit of Christ. He said that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We're not wrestling against normal people. Therefore take up Verse 13, the whole armor of God that you might be able to withstand in the evil day. And when it says the evil day, it means a day of temptation, when temptations come. Having done all to stand, stand. Are you noticing a certain word seems to be popping up? <clears throat> stand, 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 withstand. One of the important things in battle is to take a stand. Um, when cavalry troops went into battle they had the standard bearer. I remember hearing about a war, uh, a battle during the Civil War where they had the North and the South were fighting and they used to have the fellow that would hold up the, uh, the standard for you know Company E or whatever it was and, and they would show where their groups were and he would go forward. It means that they had taken that ground and people were to rally around the standard. You've heard that expression and uh, during one terribly fierce battle the south was shooting against the north and the north had been trying to advance up the hill and they were being beaten back by the blizzard of fire and, and they had retreated and everybody but the young standard bearer. He doesn't even have a gun. He's standing still halfway up the hill and they're saying bring the standard back down. And he said courageously, no, you come back to where the standard is. And that's probably a, a good example of what's happened in a lot of Christian values and morals. We're wanting to lower the standard to where the people are. And God is saying, no, the Word of God does not change. You need to bring the people up to where the Word is. That's the standard for us. And so God is telling us, take a stand. You've heard the expression, if you don't stand for something, you will fall for anything. God wants us to become rooted and grounded in the truth. Don't be wishy-washy, otherwise James says you're like a boat without a rudder and you're being battered whichever way the wind blows. Beaten around with every wind of doctrine and you know people like that. They're not sure what they believe from day to day and they just jump from pillar to post in their theology and we need to be rooted in the truth. Stand therefore, girding your waist with the truth, the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all of the fiery darts of the wicked one. And taking the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for the saints and for me, that utterance might be given to me that I might open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. It's amazing to me how often the disciples prayed specifically for boldness. 
There's a, there's a danger they understood to being meek Christians or where you're so meek that you don't ever say what you believe. He said that we might be given boldness to proclaim what we believe. Now, that's the main passage we're talking about today. I just read it for you there from Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 18. You've got seven aspects in the armor that I'm talking about. And that would be the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the shoes of the gospel, the sword of his word, and watchfulness in prayer. And I know prayer is not an article, but it was an attitude and uh, something that is mentioned by Paul in the list. And seven makes a nice good biblical number, so I included it. First one, belt of truth. I always wear a belt. And uh, it's not because I'm afraid my pants are going to fall down. But for years, I wore a belt because I always had a knife and I needed the belt to hold my knife. And now people told me that it just didn't look good for me to always have a Swiss Army knife. You can ask people who work with me at Amazing Facts. Until 9-11, I always had, 20 years, I always had a Swiss Army knife. But then I got on several planes and I forgot to take my knife off and they took my knife away. So I learned. But I still, when I go up to the ranch, I always have a Swiss Army knife. Now I always have a phone clipped on my belt. But I leave it in my car during church, otherwise it would go off and embarrass me. Um, but belts in Bible times, it was meant to hold everything together and to um, attach different gear. It could be either leather, it might be stiff cloth where it was like uh, a sash. But people in Bible times, they didn't wear the typical army uh, camis that they wear now. They, they wore a tunic. And sometimes they went down a ways so that you could, uh, you know, keep warm at night. Um, if you were going to run and you had this, you know, dress, uh, it, it could be encumbering you. And so they used to say, gird up your loins. You ever heard that expression? I'll give you an example of it. When Elijah prayed that the rain would come, he told Ahab, you better take your chariot and get back to Jezreel because there's great, the skies are black with lightning and there's a great rain that is coming. And it says, Elijah girded up himself and ran before Ahab. You couldn't run wearing one of them Bible skirts. And you wouldn't want to go into battle with your skirt flapping everywhere and your, your enemy takes it and pulls it over your head. And, and uh, you know, so what they would do is they took this belt and they, they tied it and they tucked it tightly in there. They, they had a way of weaving it together. I'm always amazed. I've, I see my friends in the Middle East and some parts of India. They put these turbans on. How quickly they can wrap one of those things. And it stays on all day long. If I tried to do that, it would fall off. I, mean, I have nothing to hold it down. But it would slip off right away. But they knew how to gird up everything into the belt. It held everything together. And it... it uh, is represented as the truth. Now when it tells us where to have on the belt of truth, what does that mean? Well first of all as we go through these different implements it's talking about characteristics of the Christian. It's not some spiritual mystery. God wants you to be truthful on the inside and sharing truth. So truth is the standard you live by. You are not dishonest. You have integrity. Truth is used 235 times in the Bible. Christians believe in something called absolute truth. People in the world, they've got a different attitude. It's relative truth. They say, well, that's true for you, but this is true for me. Have you heard that before? It's like everybody gets to pick their own truth. But, you know, scientifically that never works. You find a scientist that says, well, that'll be true for you and this will be true for me. They say, no, we can't make chemistry and medicine. You can't plan engineering based on, well, that'll be your truth and this will be my truth. There are laws that govern medicine and science and engineering and aviation and you never want to get on an airplane and halfway through the flight have the pilot say, you know, I, I believe differently about aviation laws now. I think this ship is designed to, s to float this plane and you're going to run, no. Or I think that uh, I can slow it down below the recommended speed and it won't stall. Let's all try this together. No, there's laws and if you go below the stall speed it will stall. Well it's not only true in these other fields, it is true when it comes to the purpose of life. There is an absolute truth and yet 
the world has become so wishy-washy and they say, well, I'm glad for you and your truth and I've got my truth and I may change my truth tomorrow and it's like, it's like nothing really means anything. But in the Bible there's something they call absolute truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. I am the embodiment of truth. And yet Pilate, he was like the culture today, he said, oh, what is truth? Who knows what truth is? Jesus said, you better know the truth because the truth will set you free. So right there in the very middle, you get the belt of truth. Put, keeps everything in its place. Gives you perspective. Helps you stay together. A Christian is to know the truth, tell the truth, share the truth, and live the truth. Amen? I remember uh, several years, uh, Leone Meadows, you know, has a summer camp. And if you're a pastor, uh, when my kids were young, I could take the kids for free if I would do the devotionals during the summer camp. It was a great job. I mean, I, I was pastor at the aquatics camp. And that meant I did a morning worship, I did an evening worship, and I played with my kids all day long, and it was paid for. It was a great job. It's only, a, you know, a week or so, but it was a great job. And, but I remember, you know, I also grew up on the water. My dad had a house on the water. We had three boats in the backyard. Sorry. Ski boat, among the others, and we knew how to ski. So I would help the kids learn to ski. Well, they had one boat out there that was teaching the kids how to ski barefoot. And you realize, of course, when you're skiing barefoot, you have to go faster because you've got a very little spot, your feet, displacing your weight. And in order for it to work, you've got to go quicker. And so we had this boom that went off the side of the boat, not off the back, went off the side of the boat. And as we got up to about 35 miles an hour, the people who were wanting to learn to barefoot ski, they'd go out and they'd step outside, they'd hold on the boom, they'd get all their weight on one foot, and then they'd transfer to their other foot. And they'd be going, oh, I'm skiing barefoot. And once they got that real good, you might try and get them going on the rope where they would drop a ski, go down on a foot, drop the other ski, and they're learning to ski barefoot. It's a pretty difficult process. And, and the thing is, if you make a mistake, when you fall, and you will, you don't fall at the typical 20 miles an hour. You fall at 35 or 40 miles an hour, which means you don't just splash underwater like a swimming pool. You skip across the top of the water, and it is violent. It's like concrete. Well, I remember there was this one young man, he, was, he wanted to learn to ski barefoot. He was very ambitious. Um, he didn't look like he was built for it. He was a little bigger than the average kid at camp around. And, uh, and I remember he was wearing a, still remember, he had a checker flag bathing suit. A bathing suit looked like the, you know, the winning flag on a, on a race. And he said, I want to learn to ski barefoot. He said, sure, yeah, I can do it. I want to do it. And so we got going, you know, he had his life jacket on, we got going real fast, and he sat on the edge of the boat, and we said, okay, hang on now, get, put out one foot, and he put out one foot, and, and he was going, we said, are you ready, you ready? He said, the water was glass, it was perfect condition, put out the other foot, he put out the other foot, and he was going, he looked over at us, ah, oh, I'm doing it, you know, and he got his toe under, that's all it takes, toe under, he, he just went, Poof. he just disappeared, and then we saw him go, choo, 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 he's skipping across the water, and, uh, we were a little worried about him because he hit pretty hard. Uh, and we circled around, we came back and said, are you okay? Uh, yeah. He looked pretty dazed. Do you want to try it again? No. <laughs> I said, okay. You want to hop in the boat? No. <laughs> you okay? Yeah. Do you want to try it again? No. <laughs> you don't want to get in the boat? No. And we saw him kind of looking around. And finally, and he looked like he was swimming with his legs tucked up real tight to his chest by his life vest. Well, he couldn't figure out what was he, did you hurt yourself? And, you know, and finally he said, I can't find my suit. <laughs> <laughs> now the manufacturer, he had a wardrobe malfunction is what happened. The manufacturers put a string, you know, inside boys' bathing suits so that it's, you can cinch it up around your hips so if you go off the high dive, you still have it with you when you come up. And he didn't know about that belt. And as a result of that, he was very embarrassed. Christians, the Bible says, should know the truth. We should be ready to give an answer to anyone that asks us the reason for the hope that is in us with meekness and fear. Amen? And so uh, you've got to 
cinch on that belt of truth and it keeps everything in place. The next article was the breastplate of righteousness. Now the breastplate of course is in, you know we can show this up here, it's, it's this part uh, and it was often made from, it could be leather, thick leather like ox leather which is much tougher than you would think and this sometimes it had metal riveted to it or it could be solid metal but they almost always put a tunic underneath it because it could be chain mail, it could be scales, you remember Goliath had on his big, his armor and matter of fact I think Goliath weighed a hundred, it gives you the weight, I think it's like 122 pounds. Uh, you could look it up and double check but it was very heavy. And, um, but you had to wear a robe underneath it. So when you're talking about the armor you put on the robe first because if you're out on a hot day and you got metal scales up against your skin you just get burned. And so, and you move around, it's pinching you everywhere. So they had a good tunic underneath there, this robe underneath the armor and we put on the robe of Christ's righteousness first, amen? And then they'd put this over it and it would protect all of the vital organs because you might get cut in the hand or the arm or the leg or the foot and you could limp out of the battle and live to fight another day. But back in Bible times if they got you in the torso with a sword then that was usually it. And it tells about several battles, you know the brother of uh, Joab and Abishai, he was stabbed with the back of a spear by um, Abner and there's nothing anyone could do, he slowly died because he got him in the torso and they had no way to treat infection back then. Joab then got even with Abner, stabbed him in the torso as he did Amasai and, and that was your kill zone as they say and you needed that breastplate of righteousness to survive. It was one of the most critical parts of the uh, gear. Now it could take a, a bunch of scales with between 700 and 1000 per a coat. What does it mean? Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. Well you cannot survive as a Christian without righteousness. It begins with what you call righteousness that comes through justification. We put on the righteousness of Christ. He gives it to us as a gift. It's like the prodigal son when he comes home, the father gives him the best robe. So first it's the righteousness that comes from Christ as a gift but then you've got something called sanctification. It means that you live a righteous life. You and I, say amen please, you and I must hunger and thirst after righteousness. Isaiah 59, 17, for he put on righteousness as a breastplate. This is what Paul is referring to in the New Testament. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head which we refer to a little later. Job 29, 14, I put on righteousness and it clothed me. We accept the righteousness of Christ and then we want to live a righteous life. Righteousness is the opposite of wrongness. It means you do the right things. When you know what's right, you do what's right. James 4, 7, therefore submit to God, resist the devil and he will flee with you. Another interesting factor about this breastplate, it usually it had the front and the torso, maybe the shoulders that it would protect and the abdomen and it was strapped in the back, at least the typical Roman breastplate which is what Paul is talking about. It did not provide protection on the back. They hadn't developed this medieval ancient English French armor yet which meant you didn't turn your back to the enemy because the devil is not beyond stabbing you in the back. You know that don't you? And so you want to deface him. The Bible says that um, you resist the devil and he will flee from you. You face the enemy, encourage. I love the story in the Bible, and I think I mentioned it to you before about when David and Eliezer fought back to back when they were attacked by an army of Philistines and they defeated them all but they had to cover each other's back. You've heard that expression? If you're in the Air Force they say, do you have my six? If you had 12 o'clock was ahead of you, six o'clock was your back means I'm covering your back because the back was exposed in Bible times. You didn't have armor back there. And so uh, we need to put on that armor. Matthew 4.10, now something else about this, the breastplate of righteousness. Um, we use it therefore in 
uh, fighting the temptations of the devil when he comes with the promises of God. Matthew 4, 10 and 11, Jesus said to him, away with you Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only will you serve. And the devil left him. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The next to the third implement that you find in the armor of God is the shield of faith. Uh, this was very important. Um, of course, we are saved by grace without faith. Uh, by faith, without faith, it is impossible to please God. He that comes to God must believe that he is and he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. That I believe is Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is going about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he might devour. Now, when we describe the shield of faith, it says you have the shield that you may be able to quench the fiery darts of the enemy. And I think the little picture there, you can see his shield, Roman shields full of arrows. They used to sometimes light them on fire. Now the idea of the shield, and, and the Roman shield was big enough where theoretically you could crouch and you could cover your whole body with it if you're approaching a city wall or another army and the hail of arrows comes down on you. You'd crouch behind it and you'd get just full body protection. A little bit of your helmet might stick up but you're covered there too. Um, the Spartan soldiers, the mothers when they sent their sons off to battle, they'd say come home with your shield or on it because the shield was actually big enough where you could carry somebody on the shield. And so these were formidable. They were sometimes made out of wood covered with leather. Uh, some of them were made out of steel. They were usually a little smaller because they were much heavier. But uh, the idea of the shield is it keeps you from being struck by the darts or the spear, whatever's coming at you. One of the most successful things you can do as a Christian, practically, is don't get near temptation. The shield kept those fiery darts from making contact. We get into trouble because we get too close to it and you know in some countries when they would fire arrows and shields and knives they didn't have to inflict a mortal wound they would poison the edges so just even a paper cut could take you down eventually. You don't want to have any contact with it. A lot of us fall into temptation because we get so close to it that we're brushing up against it all the time and then we can't resist at that point. The shield kept it out away from us. Amen? And we need to be on our guard. The enemy is constantly firing volleys of those flaming arrows at trying to uh, engage our carnal desires. And uh, the purpose of the shield is to deflect them. Psalm 119 verse 114. You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. So again the word is really part of everything. Having faith in God's promises. Genesis 15 1. This is what God said to Abraham. After these things the Lord came to Abraham in vision saying, Do not be afraid Abraham. I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. So the concept of God being a shield for his people is all the way through the Bible. Uh, you probably would not be afraid going into battle if you knew that Jesus was right with you, right? Well, you've got uh, the son of David with you. You have nothing to fear. Next, you've got the helmet of salvation. 1 Thessalonians 5.8 But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love as a helmet, the hope of salvation. So Paul uses this not only in Ephesians, but you catch it, he's talking about the different implements in other parts of the New Testament. 1 Thessalonians 5.8, he talks about the helmet of the hope of salvation. When you come to Christ and you accept his forgiveness, and he says, whoever confesses and repents of his sin, he is forgiven, and you know you're forgiven, that knowledge, that righteousness by faith that you receive, you have been made righteous by faith, he has promised to give you everlasting life, how does that affect you from then on? Maybe I should back up a little bit and say, where does a helmet go? Ever see a football player put it on his foot? His helmet? No. He doesn't put it on his knee? Matter of fact, I understand that um, there's been quite a ruckus in the NFL because they've proven pretty substantially that a lot of those professional players get hit so hard and so frequently in the head that later in life a lot of them have suffered from brain injury 
uh, problems. You've heard about this, yeah. And so they've been looking for years at how can we make these helmets better? And one of the things the designers did is they studied the skull of the woodpecker because they couldn't figure out how the woodpecker didn't go crazy after a week. He drives us crazy if you live by a woodpecker, but uh, we had a woodpecker at our other house and he'd go, he didn't just peck on the trees, he would go right outside our bedroom window upstairs and he would peck on the house whenever I was trying to sleep. And, uh, but they're, they're banging their heads constantly going, bomb, 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 bomb. Like, How come they don't, you know, scramble their brains? So they studied the head of the woodpecker and they found out the way that the, um, the skull was designed, it, it protected it, it insulated, helped absorb the shock. They tried to engineer some of that into the NFL helmets to protect their heads. Because you realize no matter how much of the armor you wear, if you lose your head, you're not going to make it. Right? Now above the neck, you've got seven openings. That's including your eyes, or technically an opening. Two ears, two eyes, two nostrils, one mouth. Right? You with me? Those are sacred entrances to the brain. And as a Christian, I almost think of the helmet as something like what a space suit might be, where it's giving you a whole different atmosphere under there that keeps you from having, you know, they say if you lose your helmet in the space, it just kind of explode <laughs> because the, uh, we don't quite explode, but uh, there's no pressure there. You need it to maintain that pressure to keep you alive. And as a Christian, putting on the helmet of salvation, you say, what I look at, is it going to help me in salvation? Is it going to help others? What I listen to, is it going to help me in salvation and help others? What I eat, is it going to help save me so I'm strong and I can help save others? The words that I say. So it's what goes in, I guess what you smell too, huh? So what you're doing is you are guarding the sacred avenues to your mind with this helmet of salvation. Put it on, the knowledge that you are saved. And uh, keeps us out of a lot of trouble by doing that. Paul, Romans 12, 2, he says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. And prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You put on that uh, helmet of salvation, it kind of becomes a screen of what you will and will not let in. You know, you might go into a construction area and you see a sign that says hard hat area to avoid injury from falling objects. There was uh, one of the kings in the Bible named Abimelech. He was actually a king that predates King Saul. Technically, you could say he was one of the first kings of Israel. And he wasn't very scrupulous. But he wasn't a good general either. He went against a city uh, in battle and... Um, he got right up against the wall, which you don't do, and a woman took a piece of a millstone and threw it off the wall, clobbered him on the head, and he knew he was mortally wounded. He told his soldier next to him, please kill me, because everyone's going to say a woman killed me. And we wouldn't want that. So his soldier killed him, but everybody still says a woman killed him. See, I just repeated it. He didn't have a helmet on. Now that was really dumb. You're going against battle, against the walls of a city, without a helmet. You know why Goliath fell? The Bible talks about Goliath's armor. He had a helmet on. You can read in the book of Patriarchs and Prophets that Goliath, when he saw that this shepherd was coming against him with a stick, he thought he was going to just use the stick, he was so indignant, he thought this is some political ploy. They're trying to make a statement, making me fight and kill a boy, and then I'm going to look bad. He pushed back his visor. says, what are you coming against me with a stick? I'm going to cut you to ribbons and feed you to the dogs. And, and David said, I was wondering how I was going to get you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and he put it in the forehead, which is, by the way, where the mark of the beast goes too. He pushed back his helmet, and he fell. The bigger they are, what's the rest of that? Harder they fall. The helmet of salvation means remembering you are saved. 
because you are justified by faith. And if you believe that, it will affect everything else you do. Next, we have the gospel shoes. Now, in the Bible, your foot is a symbol for your walk, the direction you're going. Paul says we should uh, walk, Romans 6, 4, in a newness of life. The Bible says if we follow Christian, if we're following Christ, we should walk even as he walked. And uh, you've read in the Bible that if your eye or your hand or your foot offends you, cut it off and cast it from you for what good is it to enter heaven uh, or enter hell with both your feet, you're better off entering heaven. And of course, no one in heaven is going to be maimed. But he's just illustrating that your feet represent your walk. Why do we have foot washing? Why did Jesus wash the disciples' feet? Why do we practice that? It represents your walk in life. And as we go through life, you kind of pick up some of the dust and barnacles of the world. And every now and then, we need this cleansing. Uh, important thing about shoes, especially in Bible times, roads now, you got nice sidewalks, you got paths, you got roads, it's all paved and smooth. It's a little bumpy, we complain. But in Bible times, if you didn't have shoes and you're going into battle, not only did you not have traction, but one of the things the enemy would do is when they saw their opponents coming, they threw really mean thorns into the path of the approaching enemy so they had to get through the thorns. If you didn't have shoes on, you weren't going very far. And it would tear your feet up. Or sometimes you had to advance on sharp, rough, rocky ground. And if you didn't have good shoes, you couldn't fight. I had a friend when I lived up in the hills uh, in a cave, a guy named Dave Hepper. And he lived up there long after I left. He stayed up there, lived up there 15 years in a cave. And he actually is still in Southern California today. Uh, and he gives tours for the Agua Caliente Indians of the reservation where the um, canyon is that I lived. He told me a story one time. He lived up there all by himself. Rough, hot, rocky, cactus mountains. Just as rugged as you can imagine. Uh, no trees. Uh, the trails are all rocky and, and rough. And there's choya cactus balls everywhere. You had to watch where you step. But there's one place where you had to cross a creek through Takwitz Creek and it was springtime and the water was flooding and he had some boots on. He didn't want to, didn't want to have his boots get wet. Uh, and so he took them off and he tied them together and threw them over his shoulder as he was crossing the creek. Well, the water was higher than he expected and he, he slipped. His boots fell off his shoulder and went down the water and over the waterfall and there's no way to go down canyon. He's up there in the desert with no shoes. And then he was relating to me the epic odyssey he had tiptoeing through the desert around the cactus, burning rocks, trying to get, trying to find a little rock that had a little shade. He'd run over there, his feet sizzling along the way. And then he'd go another place. He'd be stepping on cactus and scorpions out there and rattlesnakes. Without your shoes, you're probably pretty vulnerable. Well, you can't fight in God's army if you don't have those gospel shoes. Bible tells us that uh, keeps us from slipping. You've heard of backsliding? You notice it doesn't call it back hopping or back jumping or back skipping. It's backsliding. If you don't have cleats on your gospel shoes, you will backslide. You need traction when you're fighting the, the enemy. I remember hearing a story about two teenagers that were hiking out in the Sierras and going down the trail. They suddenly found themselves looking up at a cougar that was getting ready to pounce and it was twitching its tail. And one of the boys very calmly took his backpack off his back while he didn't take his eyes off the cougar, started to put on his tennis shoes. And his brother said, what are you doing? You can't outrun a cougar. He said, I don't plan on it. I just have to outrun you. So you need to have good shoes on. You needed something in there to lighten it up a little bit. Then you have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This is uh, repeated over and over through the Bible. Not only in Ephesians does he say that sword represents the Word of God. You can look in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Frequently called a two-edged sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow. It is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Christ came, said, I came not to send peace, but what? A sword. 
sword of his word. Now some people think that God really wants us to pick up physical swords and fight with them. And one time Jesus was speaking in parables and he said, and now I tell you that to get your garment. When I sent you out you didn't have anything and, and sell what you have and get a sword. And they said, oh Lord, we've got two swords. And then Jesus makes a statement. He says, enough of this. So they thought that meant two swords is enough. That's not what he meant. He meant enough of this. You're not getting it. It's kind of like when they were crossing the ocean and he said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. They said, beware of the leaven. Did we forget lunch again? Just totally missed the spirit. Jesus said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and life. And so when Jesus said, he that doesn't have a sword, get one. He's talking about the word of God. You got to be grounded in the word of God. You needed to be familiar with the word of God so that you could use it. You know, I, um, I play racquetball and uh, Pastor Ross plays too. So if you're going to give me a lecture on competitive sports, talk to him and he'll tell me. And when we're playing, we have a string you always put around your hand when you're playing because if you swing and you lose your grip, you could clobber someone and really hurt them. And uh, several times I've seen where people forgot to put their string on or they just neglected to put it on. They went and swung and their grip wasn't strong enough and the racket went flying across the court. And fortunately nobody was hurt. Well that used to happen in battle. These people get out there if their hands were weak and they weren't trained and skilled, they go swing their sword and go <whistles> flying through the air. You could hurt your own man. So you need to be familiar with it. You know the best way to remember scripture is share it with someone else. Uh, people say, Pastor Doug, how do you remember so much scripture? My memory is not that wonderful. I just have been sharing it so often in evangelistic meetings. There are certain texts that I just remember after a while. It's like you remember the words to certain songs that you probably shouldn't know. <laughs> Revelation 1.16 He had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. All through the Bible you can see where they had these swords. And Now the Roman sword, they had a couple swords. and I can't remember the Greek words but they had one sword that was a big two-handed sword like this one here. And then, but the typical Roman sword was a one-handed sword that was, it was a little bigger than maybe a machete. Double edged though. They used them in close quarter combat. They used it for everything. Not only used it in battles they, and they kept it sharp. They might use it to start their campfire, cut their food, but it was just constantly ever present. Every Roman soldier had one of those girded in his belt. You have the sword of God's word girded in the belt of truth. It's one thing to have a Bible, but if you don't know the truth or you're twisting it, the two need to go together. And why does it say two edged sword? You can slide to the right, you can slice to the left. It's not only a defensive weapon when you're blocking, it was an offensive weapon. So we use the sword on ourselves to guide our lives, but we use the sword to conquer for Christ in sharing the truth. And so it's something used both ways. Typically the two blades are thought of as the law and the prophets. Ten commandments were on two stones. You got the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. You call it Moses and Elijah. What, Revelation chapter 11 you got the two witnesses. It's talking about the two edges of the sword. Some people say the new and the old testament. But there's always this dual nature to the word of God that you find uh, throughout scripture. And it should be ever present in the life of the Christian. The sword of the spirit. Now the word here when it says the word of God it's not the word typically you find logos. It's the word rima. Rima doesn't mean just a word. It means a word that is spoken or narrated. Meaning this word of God used in connection with the sword here is sharing. Narrating it. Giving it. Quoting it. And another aspect of the sword is something you want to continue to use lest it become rusty. A sword is kept clean by use and it's kept sharp by a stone. You sharpen it on the rock of ages. Amen? As we study the Bible with others, uh, people will be transformed. A quote I'd like to share, and I'm almost done here. Satan well knew that the Holy Scriptures would enable men to discern his deceptions and withstand his power. It was by the word that even the Savior of the world resisted his attack. At every assault Christ presented the shield of the eternal truth saying, it is written, 
To every suggestion of the adversary, he opposed the wisdom and power of the devil with the word. In order for Satan to maintain his sway over men and establish his authority, he must keep them in ignorance of the scriptures. And the Bible will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from the Bible. So we need the word of God. And then finally, you have prayer. We talked about this a little bit last week, but Paul said, watching with all prayer. Luke 12, 37. Blessed, Jesus said, are those servants whom his master when he comes will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you, he will gird them and uh, sit down and eat with them and serve them. And if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, Blessed are those servants. You know, soldiers used to have to stay on watch. And if you went to sleep on your watch, you know what the penalty was? Death. That sounds pretty serious. When they were able to tell Pilate, yeah, they stole the body because the soldiers went to sleep, those soldiers that agreed to that were paid very well because they said, don't worry, we'll protect you. We'll protect you with Herod. They, he, he's, they'll say, let's just see with the garden, a dead body. You can't kill the guys for that. Who, who would have thunk that he wouldn't? be resurrected and, and leave. Watchmen had to stay awake. Blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allow his house to be broken into. First Peter 4, 7, But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayer. So now if you have any doubt, what does it mean about watching? Jesus said, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. Be watchful in your prayers. Oh, is watching something you do once like saluting? Or is watching an attitude It's ongoing? Watching in prayer. Soldiers need to be on their guard. Because the most important element in a battle is what? Surprise. The enemy wants to surprise you. The reason Hitler was able to so quickly take over large sections of Europe is he did something called the Blitzkrieg. Anyone speak German? It means a quick war. Something to that effect, right? A rapid war. And it was the Blitz. And the devil uses that. He, before you know what's going on, you're on the ground. And uh, in order for that not to happen, you need to be watching. You watch and pray that we can be awake. So this is all a package deal. We are to stand wearing all of the armor. We are to stand firm. Truth, righteousness, faith, salvation, gospel, word, and prayer. All of those things describe Christian character. So when you're talking about the armor of God, it encompasses us, um, our whole lives being involved. So where do you buy your armor? Um, what store do you go to? You know, we're having a camp out and next week or we're going to Leone Meadows and some of the pastors are going to be dressing up as different 18th century characters or I guess it's 19th century characters. Um, I'm trying to find Joseph Bates clothing somewhere online. I tell you, I'm having a really hard time with that. So where do you find armor? Well, you know, someone's provided it for us. One of the most tender stories in the Bible is that of David and Jonathan. It tells us that um, when Jonathan saw David kill Goliath and he saw the courage of this young man, I think Jonathan offered to kill Goliath and, and Saul would not allow the crown prince to go against him. And David saw the courage. He was so inspired and they talked a little bit and it says their souls were knit together. They had become good friends. A little amazing fact, trivia. Uh, I ran away with a friend. It was a, one of my best friends. Um, his name was David McLean. I was 13 years old. If you ever read my book, I use his real name in the book. We ran away together. I ended up, you know, thrown in juvenile hall, sent to live with my dad, lost track of David. Never saw him again for 40 years. And then I got a call from Facebook and Colonel David McLean <laughs> who ran away with me and we're still friends today. He went and uh, texted me yesterday. He's telling me what we're doing. So it's kind of interesting. We reconnected and we're still friends after all these years. David and Jonathan were just, they were close friends. 
And uh, the Bible says that Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him. There's the tunic. It goes under the armor. He gave it to David with his armor. It's the armor of a prince. Even his sword and his bow and his belt. There you have it. David finally got some armor that fit. It was given by the son of the king. You know how Jonathan died? He's killed by the Philistines and they pinned him between heaven and earth on the walls of Beth Shan. Jonathan. You know what the name Jonathan means? Gift of God. Yonathan. And here you've got the king's son, the gift of God, who dies pinned between heaven and earth, who gives his armor to David. And it helps us realize it's Jesus through his death, the son of the king, the gift of God. He is offering us his armor. But we must take it up and we must put it all on. Don't forget to request today's life-changing free resource. Not only can you receive this free gift in the mail, you can download a digital copy straight to your computer or mobile device. To get your digital copy of today's free gift, simply text the keyword on your screen to 40544 or visit the web address shown on your screen. And be sure to select the digital download option on the request page. It's now easier than ever for you to study God's Word with amazing facts wherever and whenever you want. And most important, to share it with others. Can't get enough Amazing Facts Bible study? You don't have to wait until next week to enjoy more truth-filled programming. Visit the Amazing Facts Media Library at AFTV.org. At AFTV.org, you can enjoy video and audio presentations as well as printed material all free of charge. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, right from your computer or mobile device. Visit AFTV.org. Don't forget to request today's free offer. It's sure to be a blessing. And thank you for your continued support as we take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. We hope you'll join us next week as we delve deep into the Word of God to explore more amazing facts. 